Hey everyone, I'm Raif Darazi, and today I am excited to have a conversation with our special guest, Dr. Annemiek de Rauter, to discuss HIV in women, what this means for a woman who wants to get pregnant, can they safely have children who are HIV negative, and why is there such little representation of women in clinical studies? But first, uh, for the biography, I'll pass it off to Dr. Annemiek to talk a little bit about herself. Raif, thanks very much for the kind introduction. So I've been in HIV for a very long time. Um, I started in the late 80s, which is where a number of you probably weren't born, which makes you realize how ancient I am. But I, I uh, specialized in women with HIV quite, quite early on when I joined uh, the team at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. And that's where I also became a consultant physician. And I was asked to set up the HIV and women's service there. And then by default, really, because we, I was looking after a lot of women, I gained quite a lot of experience in pregnancy in women with HIV and how to prevent their children from, from also having HIV. And that I did a lot of uh, uh, clinically based research in that area, was responsible for the British HIV Association guidelines on the management of pregnancy for a number of years. And uh, fairly recently, in 2016, I joined Vive Healthcare. I'm a head of global medical sciences, um, and I'll talk a little bit about what I do there. But I continue to do a clinical session at Guy's and St. Thomas's, and probably most of the, the patients I see still are women, most of whom come from sub-Saharan Africa. Do you want me to tell you a little bit about what I do at Vive? Yes, please. So um, head of global medical sciences, it covers quite a lot of research areas, epidemiology, health outcomes, implementation sciences, there's a number of teams. But I also chair a couple of committees, but of, of relevance, one is the pregnancy working group where we have been, I've been banging the drum ever since I arrived in pharma on the importance of keeping women in clinical trials when they become pregnant, if, you know, if they wish to, so that we can actually get some some data and know what to do and what to say to women who are either pregnant or wish to become pregnant. But we can talk about that a bit more later. I want to be explicitly clear. Anamik works for Vive Healthcare. They are a pharmaceutical company that creates medications for and focuses its efforts solely on people living with HIV. I do on occasion work in paid partnerships with them. This conversation, however, is completely separate from that. I'm not receiving any kind of payment services or benefits for doing this. This is just a result of me wanting to hear from various experts with all kinds of backgrounds. And you guys can rest assured that anytime I am being paid or work in partnership with an organization, I will make that explicitly clear at the onset. Thank you, Dr. Enemy, so much for joining me today. How are you? Great, great. It's uh, coming up to the end of the year. I'm going on holiday shortly, but uh, I'm good. Thank you. Yourself? And I know you have a really, uh, I'm, I'm good as well. I know you have a really busy schedule, so... I appreciate you making the time for me and my audience. You're welcome. Okay, so I'll start with a general question, a very broad question. You can answer it however you feel. What is your assessment of the current state of the global HIV AIDS epidemic? So if I compare to when I started, when there was no treatments, there are now very effective treatments available. The medical aspect of managing HIV has changed beyond recognition from something that was universally fatal when I started to something where if somebody has access to effective medication, regular access, that you can pretty much have a normal life expectancy, live a normal life. You've talked, I think, about U equals U before, and we can talk a little bit about, about pregnancy. I'm pleased that there's access to medication that's affordable in you know in many parts of the world now which has really changed the trajectory of the the epidemic from that point of view i don't think the stigma side has moved very much from from my perspective and i see that particularly amongst the women that i look after um where there's so much concern about disclosing who to speak to what's going to happen if i do that would i be rejected and and that side of things as there's, there's clearly a lot of work to be done because that that gets in the way of, of trying to get to that, you know, let's end the epidemic. And it's, it's really something that we need to continue to focus on because until we do that, we can't really get to that point. All right. Thank you for that. Since you noted that about the stigma, I do want to mention something you said in a presentation eight years ago, which is in quote re regarding stigma. 
which is huge in this population. Now I've been looking after patients with HIV for nearly 30 years now. And so much has improved over time, but from where I'm sitting, from what I see in this particular patient group, referring to women, I don't think it has moved on at all. So I'm curious now that it's eight years after that, and you mentioned stigma being still this huge challenge, would you say the same thing today? Have you noticed improvements? There are some improvements. I think that U equals U, for example, is something that does improve and has improved the issue of stigma, but probably more amongst men who have sex with men than than women. Um, the ability now to have a child with very, really very minimal risk of, of having HIV, that all those sorts of things, those sorts of improvements do help. But I still see many women where the only time they ever talk about HIV is when they are in, the, in my consulting room or they're speaking to the nurses that it's completely secret and nobody else knows. And we talk about disclosure, I talk and we encourage disclosure, but it's, you know, you hear a number of stories where it doesn't go well. And um, it's the, the, the knowledge generally about HIV, I think, is still within pockets of individuals. The general population still has quite a lot of ignorance about HIV. I think we're making strides forward, but I don't, I'm not sure we've moved that far from what I said eight years ago. Mm. That's um, a little, it's disappointing to hear that it's been such a str struggle, particularly for women, especially knowing that now that more than 50%, I think it's like 54% of all people living with HIV globally are women. Yeah. And I think very not that many people know that, sorry to interrupt you, but most, a lot of people, if you talk generally to the general uh, population, people who are not necessarily in the specialty will still uh, associate HIV with certain risk groups and, and with men who have sex with men. And you, you quote that figure at people and they're quite surprised um, uh, about that. But um, yeah, it's, it's, as you say, the, the numbers in terms of the numbers of women that, that are living with HIV globally, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, are really still quite staggering. Yeah, I think that's my favorite tidbit to throw out there when I'm talking to someone who isn't familiar with um, HIV at all. And I'm kind of just giving them a briefer on, on what the state of the HIV epidemic is today. And they're always shocked when yeah. they hear that. And almost, almost like skeptical. <laughs> yeah. So recently I had the pleasure of um, interviewing Dr. Neka Nwakolo, which I understand you're familiar with and you, get, you two have worked together as well. Yeah. And we talked about women living with HIV and the implications as it relates to menopause and aging, aging with HIV, um, and also a little bit the lack of representation in clinical studies. We actually, we covered a lot of different topics very lightly. So I would love to dig in a little bit more with you specifically women um, and pregnancy and clinical studies. For those of you who haven't seen that, that interview, I highly suggest you check it out. I'll put a card up here so you can watch that as well. All right, so before I dig in, I like to get into a little bit of the personal background of the people I'm speaking with. And this is, for me, it's, it's important because one of the goals of what I do on this channel is to develop a sort of trust with community members and science medical healthcare. And one way in doing that is, is to be able to humanize the people behind the studies, behind the companies, et cetera, to, to realize that you're not just white lab coats, you know, um, deviously plotting things and trying to make money behind the scenes. <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot more to it and you're three dimensional people. So I'd like to learn a little bit about your background, uh, where you're from, where you're currently living. If you want to start there. Sure. So um, I, like you, I was uh, born in the Netherlands and um, I traveled around quite a lot as a child. Uh, my father worked for an oil company and I had to go to different countries and learn different languages and constantly be thrown into a situation where you had to learn a new language and, and a new, new way of life. And then I ended up doing my major schooling in the UK 
and went to medical school in the UK and ended up marrying an Englishman. And they have many qualities, but languages tends not to be one of them in my experience. So this is still where I, I live in the UK. And uh, I have two daughters uh, who are 28 and 29. And um, yes, yeah, so my husband's also in, in the medical field. So and we live in South London. And um, we're all going on holiday to Thailand on Saturday. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and so what was your impetus to um, focus specifically on STIs and HIV? So I qualified as a doctor. I was not entirely sure what direction I wanted to go in. If I can be honest, I thought that medicine was slightly filled with stuffed suits, as I called them, and then I couldn't really see the direction I wanted to go in. And I happened to be doing a, um, a six-month job in a sexual health clinic in, in central London, and that was around 1986-87. And that's when lots of primarily gay men came through these sort of walk-in clinics where they had come to for the end for their sexual health and knew that they'd be looked after and and you know not discriminated against or anything like that and they were coming in with symptoms and signs of what we then quickly recognized was hiv and aids and that's really when a whole new specialty was born and we very quickly had to set up a specific dedicated what was an aids in, in central London and I worked uh, on that quite quickly as a very junior doctor where the ward was filling up very quickly it was very interesting there were it, a lot of us have commented on, on there was a lot of similarity between that time and, and Covid where there was something new and something was not you didn't fully understand it nobody knew exactly how it was necessarily transmitted what was going to happen although very different to COVID, there was no email, no WhatsApp, and you had to wait, you had to ring somebody on the landline, telephone, or wait for a conference to, to hear the, the, the latest information. And it was just, it was very new. It was, uh, you couldn't look it up in a big dusty book. I enjoyed the people I was working with, the people I was looking after. It was quite difficult at times because you very quickly realized that if somebody was sick enough to come into hospital at that point, because we couldn't turn their immune system around, they might leave hospital, but they would come back and, and they were going to die. And that was quite a difficult thing as a, at that time, I was in my 20s to, to um, see on the sort of scale that we saw it, nothing like the scale you'd see in you know, some of the other countries in the world, obviously, but it was, it was very, it was quite difficult. Um, you know, you have somebody who's 17 year old, 17 years old, who's got a particular problem and he looks at you and grabs hold of your hands and says, I'm not going to die, am I? And, and your temptation is to say no, but actually the answer was yes. Um, but then with the, the um, advent of, you know, we had some once, one or two drugs for a few years, it wasn't enough, it didn't really work, they were very toxic. And then in 1996, it all changed like dramatically, and we were able to really turn people around. And it was extraordinary to see people with whom you had conversations about dying, then start on these medications, which was like handfuls of pills at the time, with some with food, some without, and loads of side effects. But turn them around, completely turned around. And there's this one or two individuals I was talking to then about dying, who went on to these treatments, who I'm still looking after today, which, wow. which is quite extraordinary. So seeing that improvement, seeing those advances, and then seeing what we were able to do, for example, in pregnancy as well, and how that in, evolved, um, it just, it, it kept, certainly kept my interest, and, and it's something that I felt that I could contribute to. And I would imagine, like you said, being in your 20s, I would guess that you weren't anticipating that that was going to be your experience starting out um, and that the stories and the, I would imagine, um, emotional effects of dealing with that on a daily basis and having to come to terms with that and cope with it and, and, and still be strong and do your job um, must have given you a profound sense of purpose 
too. Yes, it it definitely did, and 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 still does, and it's one of those things where looking after people actually, and 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 the sorts of things that they also tell you, the sorts of things they confide in you, it's it's actually a huge privilege, and a lot of people end up telling you quite personal things and things that have happened in their lives, and it's just. It, it's something that every single time it sounds a bit holier than, than thou, but it's every single time, you know, you, you think that you have an issue in your own life, but actually you don't because you see, you know, you have these discussions with individuals and see what they can be going through and see, oh, you know, how they go through difficult situations um, and you can help them a little bit and, uh, it's 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 like I said, it gives you perspective, and it's a privilege to be able to do. I can absolutely relate to that. Um, I'm always surprised in how people are willing to open up to me, typically through direct private messages on social media to someone they don't know personally, never met before, but I might be the only person they feel comfortable enough sharing their story, and oftentimes these these stories are you know, quite long and, and fraught with a lot of challenges and, and yeah. heartache. So yeah. I, I can relate a little bit on that part. Can you tell us a little bit more about your role at Vive Healthcare? What, is that, what does it mean, your title? The, the titles in pharma, one of the things I have learned is that they're, they're always quite grand. I, and it's a sort of title mm-hmm. where I speak to my mother and she thinks I run the entire company when you read it. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's obviously not like that. But Head of Global Medical Sciences, it's it's really looking at, I mean, there's a, a, it's a very diverse role, which is why it's actually quite interesting. I come back home to my husband and he says, well, what have you been doing? And it's, I say this, this and this. And he says, oh my God, there are all these different things. No wonder you don't get bored. But a lot of it is to do with generating evidence. Say, for example, once certain drugs have, have hit the market and are being used and then people will come to us and say, well, we've noticed this, or we'd like to look at this, or we think we should look at that. And and, and so we do a lot of looking at what, what are the data gaps in terms of what do we not know yet, maybe something in pregnancy and children or whatever, and trying to fill those questions that people have about the products that we have, which is only to do with HIV. That's a big part of it. We also have... Uh, Organizations like the FDA, the EMA, who who once you have a product that hits the market, you need to show that, you know, it has value, that it's safe and and all those sorts of things, perhaps that not that many people necessarily know about. Um, I sit on a number of committees where other people will come in and say, look, we'd like funding to try and look at this, this and this, and then we try and make some judgments around that. And in the pregnancy working group, which which was set up, like I said, I, I arrived at Vive and, and I think they got so fed up with me just going on and on and on about this pregnancy that they gave me the committee to um, chair with, with one of my safety colleagues and actually start to address some of these issues that, that I felt were so prominent before I joined Farm. And I can go into that a little bit if, if you like. So I would I'm I want to know what why you were suddenly so you know gung ho about pushing this with the pregnancy specifically. So let me step back and and just go over a little bit about what is what is possible and what happens if if somebody a woman living with HIV becomes pregnant. And a lot of people would think, well, there's somebody who has HIV, there's a baby inside her, then surely it must also have HIV. But in fact, even if you do nothing and don't intervene, most women don't transmit to their babies, um, even if we don't intervene. It's about, it varies on the level of virus, etc. But it's about 35 or 40% who will transmit if you if you don't intervene. So it's always quite, quite surprising that to a lot of people. Yeah. But when when we, uh, some studies were done early on, and we quickly worked out that if you intervene with antiretroviral drugs and avoid breastfeeding, but I'll come back to that. Those were our first interventions. And then 
do a cesarean section. Now, all of that's moved on, but that's how we started. If you have those three mm -hmm. interventions, now you don't need all of them anymore, but that's where we started. You can get, and we quick, very fairly quickly got transmissions rate, transmission rates down to about one or two percent. So from 35, 40 percent to one or two percent, that was you know achieved fairly early on, and that's quite startling. And that's and for me, because I, I have looked after a lot of women for sub-Saharan Africa, for, and I mean, for a lot of women, obviously, having a family is important. And then culturally, it is perhaps even more important in, in, in certain parts of the world. That, for me, just became just such an interesting thing to do and such a rewarding thing to do. And you have to, you know, you have somebody who may be diagnosed in pregnancy who's very, very nervous about sorts of things not just her own infection but what she, you know everything that goes with that but so worried about okay is my baby going to have this as well and to be able to reassure or to a large extent intervene and get that down to really very very low numbers is is it's one of the best things i've ever been involved with and and that joyful moment where you can say to somebody where you can absolutely confirm your child does not have HIV is one of the best things that, that you can ever do. And that's so those are the three interventions that we were using quite early on, but with more powerful medication and same sort of concept as U equals U, which I think you've talked about before, we now know that you don't need to do a cesarean section anymore. And that's one of the things that we started to, to look at and research quite early on in the UK and others did that as well. And so most women can now aim for a normal vaginal delivery, which is great. So you don't have to go through a cesarean, but you still have to take medication. I'll come on to that in a minute because that's what, what drove me to push the area that I was pushing in. And, and the issue of breastfeeding and whether to breastfeed or not, is quite a topical one at the moment. And I can expand on that a little bit more either now or, or later, if you wish. I'm sure. Yeah, let's let's touch on that now. So let's talk about breastfeeding, first of all, in and that... We know that if you don't do anything, if you don't intervene, that breastfeeding transmission is a, is a significant component of that original 35, 40% that I was talking about. So quite early on, that led to the guidelines that women should not breastfeed. Now, that is easier said than done, in particularly in, in certain parts of the world where you know, if you don't breastfeed, you, okay, you may have removed perhaps a significant chunk of HIV transmission, but then actually infants were getting sick for other reasons because breastfeeding is such an important thing to do. So guidelines have evolved in that in parts of the world. And where, just to make that clear, yeah. you're talking about malnutrition. For instance, they might not have access to baby formula they or may not, an alternative. Yeah. Exactly. They may not have access to baby formula, but also it involves a water supply and the water supply that needs to be safe. And so a lot of these infants in certain parts of the world were actually uh, getting sick and dying because they were having problems with gastroenteritis and all sorts of infections because mm. they were not having breast milk. Now, obviously, there are many, many advantages, as we always hear of, of breastfeeding uh, and particularly in, in well, it's everywhere, but but particularly for the prevention of, of infections as well in young children, that's, that's a very important part, um, a very important component in certain parts of the world. So we ended up with this dichotomy, if you like, that people so quickly realise, well, we have to breastfeed in, in certain parts of the world because if we don't, we're running into very different problems. And at the same time, antiretroviral therapy was getting more powerful along the U equals U lines. But it meant that women that... I would see who would come to see me in the UK and in Europe and, and in the US, they'd be told, no, you can't breastfeed, but perhaps their sisters and cousins in sub-Saharan Africa were allowed to breastfeed. And that already started causing confusion. But the, the social aspect and the social importance and the cultural importance of breastfeeding cannot be overstated particularly in certain parts of the world where you know, a, a number of women that, that I have looked after would say, because I would say, okay, we take, use these drugs, we may or may not have a vaginal delivery and we advise you not to breastfeed, thinking that that was the easy part, but actually women would find that the most difficult part 
and would say to me, well, you may as well tattoo HIV on my head if I don't breastfeed mm. because it is what everybody does. And so therefore wow. we started to, and it, we're not there yet. And guidelines have been slow to evolve in places like Europe and, and even slower in the US around, look, if somebody's on antiretroviral therapy, their viral load is undetectable and they want to breastfeed, we should support them in doing so. And those numbers are now also going up in, in certainly in the UK and in, in parts of Europe. And like I said, I think the US, US has been a bit slower with that. But that is something that we hope that in the same way that years ago, I'd say, well, we need to do a cesarean section. And then actually, no, we, we were able to switch to vaginal delivery that in a few years, we can much more comfortably say, well, you know, breastfeeding is, is absolutely fine. But it, we're, it's it's much more now about giving the women information, allowing women to make their own informed decision, and a slightly less hopefully paternalistic attitude that perhaps has been the case um, over a number of years. So, at this point, and excuse me if I missed it, but women are still advised not to breastfeed, or they can In... if they're undetectable. So in sub-Saharan Africa, South Africa, all, all the parts of the world, the women will be given given the opportunity to choose. But the reality is that the vast majority will breastfeed and should breastfeed. And if they have access to antiretroviral therapy, that's, that's absolutely the right thing to do. But I would say that guidelines in other parts of the world are evolving and there's still not a uniform uh i would say accepted position that that gotcha. they should just uh, people should just say look look yes you can breastfeed well one of the things i always say is to, to whenever i talk on the topic is talk to women about it talk about it early it's not so that it doesn't come up late in the pregnancy where everyone hasn't had that discussion yet but increasingly the numbers are going up in in europe and i think will go up in the us as well but it is an area where there's still some work to be done. It seems like we're doing a, basically a cost benefit analysis based on the person's individual um, situation, access to resources, access to things like formula, what have you, water, like you said, yeah. and then making the decision based on that. And since we don't have enough studies per se that everyone can come to a consensus, um, that's the way it's being done. Yeah, and, and and a lot of the studies have been done in, in Africa, which was right, because cause that's where it was most most relevant to, to, to find this answer. I think the field is still, in Europe and in the US, it's still a little bit conservative. It's, you know, if if we can do this without breastfeeding, then why introduce what people see as maybe a very small risk. And there are some unknowns, you know, how much of the drugs get into the breast milk and how much does the baby take on board. But but I, I think we are, there's still a little bit too much caution. And particularly now in the last, you know, in the last five years, I would say there's much more of a an acceptance, which is good, that we need to give women the information to make the choices for themselves and not necessarily impose our own our own thoughts and fears onto that you know we, absolutely we need to give the information and say this is the pro these are the pros these are the cons it's not definite but you know this is this is where we're at right now how important is it for you to to breastfeed and, and really take it from there in partnership you're speaking my language i'm frequently talking about how many healthcare professionals err on the side of conservatism and almost a sense of rigidity about giving a general guidance to all their patients, no matter what. For example, for me, I'm always talking about bodybuilding and fitness and supplements. And just a lot of my viewers will see my content and say, my doctor says no supplements, no whey protein, nothing. And um, as out, out of extreme caution, which I don't think applies in many ways with the advancements we have in the ARVs today. But so it doesn't surprise me to hear you say that about um, breastfeeding as well. I'm curious now, because you mentioned the 1% uh, transmission rate, is that today, if, if a woman is 
undetectable for six months or longer um, on effective treatment, is it still about 1% transmission risk? So it's 1% probably overall. Um, and, and, and that is probably driven by women who, for one reason or another, either present late or can't necessarily take the antiretroviral therapy. And, you know, we, I have women that I've, I've looked after who get diagnosed in pregnancy and they're homeless. They have priorities which they feel they need to, to address first, which is completely understandable. And, and their own health may not always be top of the list. So when we look at the, the, the low numbers of people who now do transmit, there's usually a problem of sorts that has occurred, which is usually meaning that they're not able to either access or take the medication. In certain parts of the world, the transmission rate is higher because there just is not the access to medication yet, or it's not, not universal. In other parts of the world, transmission rates are higher because people are becoming infected during pregnancy, which is another completely different story. Um, but if somebody is fully suppressed on treatment, then the the risk of, of transmission, it's it, we can't quite put it at zero, but it's literally like about 0.1%. It's, it's very, very unusual. So you can give a lot of reassurance, which is nice. Okay, got it. So the 1% is referring to all women with or who acquire HIV getting pregnant regardless of their viral load, undetectable status. So, yeah, I mean, the 1% would be, yeah. Um, so in, in say, for example, in the UK, Europe, US, it's, it's around that number. And it's usually women who have got some problems, social problems or housing or disclosure or, or something like that. Um, and But in certain countries, this transmission rate is higher because of lack of universal coverage of antiretroviral therapy. And that's perhaps more common in sort of central West Africa, but then also mm -hmm. that issue around women actually contracting HIV whilst pregnant, which when you contract HIV, your viral load goes up very, very high. And if that's the case, transmission is more likely. And also if it happens whilst you're breastfeeding, uh, it's, you know, obviously then you may transmit that way. Women are at a very high risk of contracting HIV in in the immediate postpartum, I period after they've just delivered and when they're breastfeeding. And that's more a sort of social, cultural issue. Okay. And so beginning to talk about clinical studies and the research being done, how important do you think, as someone who also works directly with people living with HIV, how important do you think having that experience is when also doing clinical studies versus someone who does clinical studies, does not work with people directly living with HIV? So um, I think the, the the combination of the two is is helpful because sometimes we can put things in studies or plan things or and then you think, well, that's not going to work because nobody's going to do that, that, that kind of thing. So it allows you to to put a bit of reality into it and, and you know, not maybe some things that are asked of participants and you think, hang on a minute, you know, these people are already coming in and doing this, 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 and this, can you really expect them to do all of that as well? So, so I think it's, it's uh, more, more knowledge and experience is always better, I think in, in this space. Yeah. And you mentioned calling participants versus subjects or patients. And that alone, the, the language used for a clinical study can be hugely impactful when um, aiming to fight stigma and really put humans first. And, and I, I, would, I would wager to guess that there are a lot of things that you do and say, your behavior, your insight, that is unconscious simply because your understanding of people living with HIV is personal. It's not yes. um, you know, data on a spreadsheet, per se. Oh, absolutely. And um, and that's the sort of thing you you bring into you know a number of discussions consciously or subconsciously, as you say. So there have been some recent clinical studies that I've noticed that talk about the efficacy, safety of particular ARVs during pregnancy. Um, can you speak about that a little bit? Challenges, maybe? 
Yeah. Um, I mean, it's good to see those studies. I think that's the most important thing. One of the, the very frustrating things of looking after women, um, writing guidelines for you know how to manage pregnancy or, or women of childbearing potential, what, what do you put them on, is that there's, there's simply for, for many years has been no data because women are often excluded from clinical trials unless they use incredibly rigorous contraception and even then they may be excluded from clinical trials and as soon as people as as, we, as soon as women become pregnant up until fairly recently certainly in the field of HIV and beyond they're removed from the clinical trial and mm. as a somebody looking after women who you know everybody with HIV should go on to treatment if 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 possible and women will say, is this safe if I decide to have a, a child? Or if they come to me and they're already they're pregnant, they, they're on, on the treatment, they say, are these drugs safe? And you kind of, you know, end up going, well, um, we don't have much information. And that is really worrying for them and, and frustrating not to be able to, to give them some reassurance. And so what I lobbied for and many others before joining Pharma, but have had an opportunity to, to shape a little bit within pharma is to, is to um, change that approach. And it's been, I've probably been like a bit of a stuck record, but it's really been a case of, and that's what people have said to me internally here, is that what I brought is that I've explained what are the consequences of those actions? What are the consequences on a day-to-day -day basis for clinicians, for women, if you don't gather those data. And it's not just directly in the pregnancy situation, it's also, you may have a quite a new drug that everyone says, well, this is the best drug. There's no information in women on pregnancy and therefore women don't get prescribed the new drug. So that's happened quite a lot in the past that what's considered to be the bee's knees in terms of what, you're, what people want to take, women don't get because there is this, you know, they're seen as a, Bit of a vessel to have children and that's more or less it and therefore they don't don't get that so yeah, how do you handle the eth how do you handle the ethical concerns there um it's kind of chicken or egg situation where you have to to do the studies in order to be able to provide the medication but yeah i mean yeah it, it's a difficult one um but it's the thing with hiv is that it's not like having a sore shoulder which is Probably not very nice either, but but where if you're taking something, you might be able to stop if, if you're pregnant. You have to take antiretroviral therapy during pregnancy. Otherwise, that reduction that I've talked about going from 35, 40 percent to near zero doesn't happen. So we have to give women antiretroviral therapy of some sort. So you need some information on that. And it's it's a risk you know, is you need to weigh up the risk benefits of, of, you know, what you're giving that individual. Do you know anything about it? Do you know nothing about it? But one of the phrases that's been, been used, and you may have heard this, because there are a lot of people externally, it's not just our company, other companies as well, who are really tackling this properly, is not protecting pregnant women from research, which has been that, that, the phrase, but protecting pregnant women through research and actually carefully mm. planning, doing your studies, doing all the necessary toxicity studies early, making a call, including women of childbearing potential, fully informed, obviously. And then if they do become pregnant, risk benefit discussion again, what do, what, how are you feeling on this medication? What do we know about this so far? And giving women the option to continue because that's also what we've heard loud and clear when there's been issues with, you know, some scares in pregnancy that we've had with, with various drugs over the years. Where women say, don't make the choice for us. We may, you know, be perfectly happy to take part in research and just give us the opportunity to do so. And that is something that needs to be harnessed and then can be harnessed in a way that increases knowledge about this area. And so that we can, when somebody comes to us and says, I've conceived on this particular combination, we can say, okay, well, this is what we know about it. it. May not still be as much as we know about absolutely everything, but 
that at least we don't look blankly and say, well, not sure. Yeah, I think it's important as long as there are, there's a structure set in place where there is a certain level of baseline safety and yeah. efficacy. Absolutely. And so that therefore, when you are going to different populations, you don't address a population that might be desperate and might say yes and willing to take on way more risk than someone who's in a privileged situation. And then those people kind of find themselves in a precarious No, situation. absolutely. And, and, and there are a lot of safeguards in place and um, the regulatory authorities are very much on top of all of this and ethics committees as well. And to make sure that, that there is no perceived coercion or taking advantage of, of some vulnerabilities that people might have. So there's a lot of people involved in, in looking at this and, and the, the process of consent and what is, what is available to you, what, what could you switch mm -hmm. to? Um, you know, you really need to inform people about what their options are. And I'm assuming that double blind placebo studies is kind of off the table. In many cases. I don't think it's off the table. Well, placebo no. would be off the table in terms of a, a, a pregnancy situation. Absolutely, you cannot yeah. give. I mean, you can't. You you might still get as that, far as people living with HIV. Yeah, th that if that was the only thing that 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 they are on, that that's not going to happen. You're not going to ever be on on nothing, and then that wouldn't be right. There may be studies where you are. Uh, whether people are double blind, so you, you you may have something that's that's one thing or the other, but it's never going to be sure. nothing. Um, yeah. Or there may be something perhaps that where something is is being added to an existing regimen um, or not, which could potentially be placebo, if you see what I mean. But nobody yeah. would ever be, and should or could be ever be left not taking anything at all. Yeah, I think that was an important distinction to make because when people think of clinical studies, yeah. oftentimes they think of, oh, someone gets a placebo and someone gets the medication. And what happens to that person in this case? But it allows women, it, this approach also allows women, uh, as I've hinted at before, to to have access to newer things as well, which otherwise are, are denied them if, if there's such a conservative, stringent attitude. But it's, it's you know it's it's it doesn't change overnight this it's it's baby steps and and taking people no pun intended yeah as no pun intended what about prep are the same sort of um hurdles present there as well yes um i think so um it's it's not that different but uh prep does allow you know, particularly in areas of high high prevalence, allows allows women to conceive safely, which is important. Um, there are similar issues around considerations around those sorts of studies, but in a similar way, we and others have have moved on from that and are keeping people in clinical studies if they wish to, if they're getting benefit from whatever it is they're taking, um, and wish to stay in the study, and that helps them if that's what what they're they're gaining benefit from and and at the same time you know we can gather information lots of different outcomes etc to inform other people who may be considering uh, such an intervention okay great I'm, i i want to start i'm going to start bringing the ship into shore i have so many things that i would love to talk to you about but time is flying by um and we can always if you're open um do this right. again another time yeah. Okay, great. So I want to talk a bit more about clinical studies and the lack of representation mm -hmm. and what your perspective is on that and what can what what do we do? How do we address that? So I mean I can speak mainly about clinical studies in HIV and if if you look at certainly yeah. a lot of the um early studies and still now, but particularly the early studies, it would have been pretty much 90% white men who have sex with men who make up the, the bulk of the, the participant group. Now, at Vive, but also at other companies, but I think we were one of the earlier companies to, to really try and push for that to be different, to include more women, where this conversation that we've just had is, is helpful um, when you start to relax some of the rules around not having to use, you know, absolutely impossible forms of contraception that nobody can can really deal with. Um, 
also in, involving people from different ethnicities because that's important for you know all sorts of reasons um but in the same way that with some of the early drugs we realized actually that women were having different side effects to men are there also differences between different ethnic groups in terms of outcomes and and side effects so one of the things that that Vive has done and and other companies as well is set targets to for both the the, the studies that we run ourselves or sponsor ourselves which where we're responsible for them but also in the ones that we support so say when i you know earlier on i told you that people might come to us and say we'd like to look at this this and this and this and then they say this is what we're going to do and then we say well actually you don't have very many women planned for this or you are you have you got enough diversity within your your clinical study so that it is something that is improving with some of the studies at vive we have actually gone to the point where okay for every say four men you recruit you you've absolutely got to you can't recruit another one until you recruit a woman that sort of thing and and you get sometimes get some pushback from people but you do have to get to to put those things in place to to start to to normalize the inclusion of more diverse populations but there's still a long way to go but it's better than it was okay I'm always thinking because, you know, it's one thing to to stand up and shout and raise your hands and say, you know, this is a problem. It needs to be fixed. We need to change it. It's another to present potential solutions. So I'm always looking for what are the incentives that would help push that along? Um, I think it's incentives can be and a lot of times more powerful than um, than saying, well, it has to be this way by, by law or by rules. Um, so I just wonder, because a lot of the focus does need to focus on women in sub-Saharan Africa. And from what I've learned, there isn't a whole lot of infrastructure, at least not on the level that it is here in the States or in Europe or other places in the world. And so logistically, I mean, typically when you have a clinical study where you need to see a, a participant on a regular basis and do lab work and lots of like in-person things, it's hard to, to kind of have someone be traveling. So logistically, sure. I would imagine you would want it to be localized. So how do we incentivize building up an infrastructure in sub-Saharan Africa and having studies being done there? Do you have any insight well, on that? I mean, there are actually a huge number of studies done there now and okay. um, incredibly successful studies. And we've just, you know, it's re really excited. We've we've got one that's just starting in Botswana, which is looking at um, PrEP in, in uh, women who've just delivered and, and are breastfeeding. And, and that country, just as an example, is incredibly well set up, both in terms of mm. the, how the outcomes generally amongst people living with HIV, but also the studies that they do are really, really high caliber. And similarly, there are you know South Africa and other countries as well in sub-Saharan Africa where there is a huge amount of research coming from there. Um, but it's it is you're right that that we put. And it's not just there, but but anywhere where you're you're particularly wanting to include women, they may be, you know, they may have just a few more responsibilities than perhaps some of the men that we've we've traditionally had in in studies. So thinking about um, childcare, either do pay for it or, or organise it, or um, just to think about some of the practicalities of actually making it a reality for women, because I do think. The, the other incentive, as you say, as a, which is not necessarily a tangible incentive, is just carrying on talking about how important it is to have that diversity in clinical trials and for people to themselves start to, in, throughout the world, to, to start to think, right, we need to think about this. How do we get more diverse populations and what can we put in place to make this work? Mm -hmm. Sub-Saharan Africa is pretty, you know, they're, they're, there's some absolutely incredible research coming from, from that region. Okay, well, that's good to hear. I, I think my what I was 
hearing was specifically related to HIV care research. So that might be a slightly different environment. And I think also on a purely as a private organization, as a private company with your own like needs and having revenue targets and things like that, I think it just makes sense logically. And I say this because I know there will be people watching that think nobody cares about people in sub-Saharan Africa or people in um, Southeast Asia who are struggling and um, don't have a lot of resources. Why, why would a company like Vive even bother? That's uh, often the cynical take, but I think that inherently there is incentive there to be able to provide a to provide this medicine, this treatment, which is your source of revenue also. So that's inherently part of being a successful company. You're helping people and then you're also getting that in return. I mean, one of the reasons I joined Vive is, is because of the focus, which is global and really meaning what, what is said by, by don't leave, you know, leave nobody behind. And we don't really have time to go into all of that today, but maybe if I do come back and talk to you another time, maybe we can talk about some of the specific things that are done in different parts of the world where there's a really big emphasis on, on that in terms of the studies, which are then importantly relevant to that region. It's not just do a study and then off you go, but absolutely things that are that we support that are of you know, great importance in that region. Um, and the other side of things, of course, is the, and again, we're not the only ones, is to, you know, particularly in, in parts of the world where funding is, is more difficult for medication, is to make, make sure that, that um, generic companies can actually you know, you make the relevant drugs that are effective as early as possible and, and make them available. That's, that's a huge, hugely important part as well. Okay, we'll end it there. Thank you, Dr. Anamik, so much. Uh, before I let you go, I would like to do, I would like to ask you what, so what do you do when you are clocked out for the day? You're ready to unwind, um, recharge the battery. What are your hobbies? So I, um, what are my hobbies? I, I quite like to cook. I don't think I'm very good at it, but, uh, but it's, <laughs> it's just quite a nice way. I find it very difficult to come home and do nothing. I wish I could, but I, I can't. So I quite like speaking to my husband and, you know, when, if, if he talks to me and, and, you know, I'm doing something in the kitchen, which, which I enjoy. I'm quite a, um, I hobbies I like I do like uh speed as in in fast moving things and mm. I've you know enjoy riding on the back of a motorcycle I have <laughs> a couple of times abseiled I think you call it rappelling down the side of our 12 story hospital for charity um wait what so we it, do you call it rappelling where you you go down? Yeah. You know, like, not that I look like, like a cruise when I do it, but it's a little bit less less organised than that. But yeah, we did that for charity at Guys and St Thomas's Hospital, the North Wing, which is a pretty tall building, and then do that. Abs we call it abseiling. You call it rappelling. You know, going backwards down and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So you if know, you have a picture of that, I would love to include that. So oh my god! I can I can probably find one. I look like a little dot though on on with a circle okay. around it, which I might be able to send you. And uh, I like you know, skiing, scuba diving. So so that you get a bit of a gist. But I also just like yeah, active. normal things as well, and and just talking to my daughters and just listening to how they're getting on in life. Okay, awesome. Um, is, do you want to share any socials where people can follow you or? websites things that you resources that you think are important um this is where the the comms people slightly despair of me um because <laughs> i'm not terribly good at any of these things i apparently am somewhere on linkedin but that's about it i think <laughs> okay great um everyone at home please comment below your thoughts comments and questions i'm happy to follow up after the fact well hopefully we can bring dr anamik on at some point in the new year and please like this video, subscribe, hit that bell so you get a notification every time a new video comes out. That is the best way that you can 
support me and this channel. Until next time, cheers. Thanks a lot. Bye.